Welcome to Ironbound Insights. I'm Vic DeLuca. Tonight we're going to talk about the Thomas Street problem. We were back three months ago and we spoke about this. It's an abandoned factory in which there's thousands of barrels of uh, toxic waste. And we have three people who have been working on the issue that will be sharing some information with us. We have Joan Nordone from the Thomas Street area residents, Roger Watson, who's the principal of South Street School, which is adjacent to the area, and Arnold Cohen from the Ironbound Committee Against Toxic Waste. Joe, you were on three months ago, and uh, you talked about the problem, and you, at that time you were having, uh, you had had a demonstration, and um, you were having another one, and uh, you were going to go to court. Where are we right now with the whole problem? Okay. Well, uh, now it stands is that the residents and their lawyers went back to court, and in May, the judge put the uh, DEP in charge of the situation because the owners were not effectively cleaning up the building. So the, uh, in May, the DEP became ch in charge, and they have until August to clean the uh, building up. The DEP is the Department of Environmental Protection? Yes. Okay. And so they have until August to clean the yes. building. And this is under the court? Order. Order. So yes. the court is watching? Yes. We, we have a, uh, our lawyer, who is a, a lawyer out of the Public Advocate's Office, uh, keeps us informed because the DEP sends her uh, status reports and then she sends them to us and then if we have problems we can go back into court to tell the judge what we're up against. Mm -hmm. And are the residents going to the court? Yeah. Uh, this it's, must be daytime, it must be hard for some working people. Yes, uh, it's just that uh, people who can make it a lot of times the uh, uh, women who are involved with, while their husbands are at work or some of our retired residents we go to court and we try to show the judge that we are supporting our uh, lawyers in this case and that we're very concerned about what is happening in our area. Has there been any reduction in the waste, I mean the number of barrels have been has it gone down some since the <laughs> well, fire? Well, it's supposed to have gone down, and then, we, then it always kind of picks up a little. But since the fire, uh, they reduced the uh, from 20,000 containers or something down to about, uh, I have a list here, uh, 12,000 various containers. They're in a size from one pint to 80 gallons. So there's still 12,000 yes, containers there. Yes, and if these are made into an equivalent of 55-gallon drums, there's an equivalent of 4,000 uh, 55-gallon drums still in the building. Let me ask you, Mr. Watson, uh, Joe presents a, a picture that really hasn't improved that much. There's been some, some uh, effort, but it hasn't improved that much. You were there with the children in the school. How many children go to the school? Uh, About 430 children. And what is your concern? How do you see the school and the school children relating to this uh, factory here, this abandoned building? It's extremely important for two reasons. First of all, the building itself is less than a city block from the school itself. Secondly, adjacent to the building and across the street on both sides, there are houses mm -hmm. all along on both sides of the street. Many youngsters play in the area. The place is not effectively guarded. As a matter of fact, a few months ago, a young man came into my office about 9.15 in the morning with first and second grade youngsters who had strayed into the building on the way to school. They were actually in the building? The actually apprehended in the building. These are small youngsters. We have kindergarten youngsters also mm -hmm. in the area. And of course, there are, there are younger children who live in the area. and. Obviously, since parents are not going to be holding children by the hand, uh, and there's no guard there, there was no guard there at the time, there's not, nothing to prevent these youngsters from going into the building and becoming involved with the toxic waste. And the children are naturally curious. As that's to correct. What's I have children of my own, and I know that's only natural for children to be uh, that way. They want to explore. That's correct. And this is not the place for them to explore. But there is, there's no guard there now, Joe? Well, they do have, I've seen one security man, mm -hmm. but they don't have an effective uh, force like two or three men. So I really don't know how well the building is guarded. I mean, that's uh, a huge building. So even if they yeah. had one person, the children could go in different areas yes. and, and get into the building. How about the broken windows? We had talked last time about the broken windows. Well, they haven't been repaired. The most they've done is, is put a plastic or... Uh, orange tarpaulin in front of some of the windows where the fire had, cur had occurred because that's where they're broken the uh, most but uh, they have not been replaced and the Newark Fire Department went around and counted over 800 broken windows in the building. Still to this day. Right, which have not been repaired. 
Well, the Committee on Toxic Waste has, has been doing a lot of effort in the, in the neighborhood to clean up a number of uh, places, and this is one of them. What about the fines? We talked last time that the judge was going to impose some fines on the owners of the building. Problem is, is that the fines are a joke. Fines, the judge finally imposes his fines after the owner of the building is no longer part of the case. After the judge orders the Department of Environmental Protection to come in and take over. Problem is, people who are supposed to collect the fines, Department of Environmental Protection, traditionally don't collect their fines. So what's being set up in the state is a precedent where these companies know, like this company, they can operate illegally and they can get away with it. Nobody, you know, their fine is minimal compared to the amount of business they were able to do while in operation. And nobody's been gone, nobody's went to jail. There's, there's, if they don't pay, they don't go to jail. There's no, it's, it's uh, sort of business as usual. We'll try to collect the fines. 90% of the fines they never collect. And that's why Signo, who's the company who originally owned the chemicals, never cleaned up during the nine months that they were in charge. They knew they could sell off the chemicals, they could operate their business, and not bother with the cleanup, because nothing was going to happen to them. And, and is, uh, what, are, what are the residents and other community people doing now to, to uh, monitor the situation? Okay. What we've done is set up an oversight commission, because what we've seen in the past is, is that the Department of Environmental Protection comes into these situations, is in charge of these situations, and does not protect the health of the people in the area, does not clean up. We've seen that in chemical control was the prime example. The Department of Environmental Protection was in charge of a situation. You have an explosion. Supposedly you had more chemicals coming in while the Department of Environmental Protection was in charge. So we want to make sure that that situation does not get repeated. And the way to do that is to bring together all the different aspects in the community that are affected. Mr. Watson is a principal of a school. We have Sister Mary Walters, another principal in a Catholic school in the area. We've brought in somebody from who's a one of the community organizers, Sister Jacinta Fernandez, familiar with the Elizabeth chemical control situation, the representative from the senior citizens in the area, so that effectively we've brought together all those different interest groups to look at the Department of Environmental Protection and to keep a close eye on what they're doing. And that's what's real important, is to let them know that they're being watched, and if we, don't, if we see that there's something wrong going on, we can go straight back to the judge and we can yell. So you're going to, the judge is going to have another hearing in August and yeah. that's when the building, he, I, let me see if I can put words in the judge's mouth. He's going to sit there and say, okay, tell me if the building's cleaned or not. Is that right? Yes, that's the way I understand it. He, that by this August date, the building should be cleaned up. They should have moved the chemicals out. Those 12,000 yes. containers of yes. chemicals. Yeah. Are the residents there? happy with that. I mean, this has been going on now for, I believe you had a, a year anniversary yes. uh, demonstration yes. to yes. show that this has been going on yes. far too long. So are the residents happy that this keeps getting postponed? Or? No. They, see, this is the thing is that uh, you get the sense of frustration among the residents because uh, it's been a year, uh, as Arnold had said, fines, uh, minimal fines are imposed. Nobody really goes to jail for breaking the law. Uh, the DEP just doesn't come in and move those chemicals out to a safe area and then, then worry about disposing them. And people get very frustrated and very, you know, cynical because they don't see an effective government or police action on the, uh, on the site. But yet you've been able to maintain that cohesive group, as yeah. hard as it might have been yes. over a yes. long haul. Because it seems that you've been growing. I know Mr. Watson's involvement now and you've obviously gotten more parents involved than teachers and students. I think that's important especially for our viewers, that I guess the point is that any of these things, it takes a long struggle. Um, unfortunately, uh, the system doesn't move uh, quickly enough for, for the need. I mean, they should have cleaned it up. I mean, the point that you made three or four months ago, it yes. should have been cleaned up immediately. Do you find more people at the school are aware of it and willing to be involved now because of uh, the danger that it poses? Yes, I think the awareness the fact that I've gotten involved and I work closely with Mr. Cohen and the whole idea of the waste in general. Mr. Cohen, for example, came to my school. He, the nurse invited him. He gave a program concerning um, the matters in general. Mm -hmm. And that uh, kind of helped to bring about an awareness in terms of the Thomas Street situation. I think one of the things, though, with the publicity that it received in the newspapers, 
people in general presumed that because of the priority in making the front page of the newspaper, uh, once it disappeared out of the papers, people presumed that the matter had been taken care of. Uh, most people generally have, have trust in the agencies that have the responsibility of taking care of these things, especially in light of what has happened in the last two years in New Jersey. And um, I think that when it became uh, public knowledge that a year had passed, uh, as Mr. Doan indicated, uh, people just could not believe it because they see the residents, the houses, the children playing and, and uh, finding out that they're explosives, they're dangerous, deadly chemicals, there for more than a year. So people are frustrated because they can't seem to get a handle in terms of who is actually responsible. You have the state, you have DEP, you have the private industry, the, the owners. It seems as though the business uh, persons who own the place would take the community responsibility and say, okay, it's in our best interest to get it out in addition to the residents. Well, the, the uh, efforts now seem to be geared towards the uh, April court date. If, let's assume uh, everything would go okay and that the place would be cleaned out. Uh, if it isn't, is there any, are there any other plans, any other lawsuits, uh, ideas, uh, demonstration ideas that, are, that you're thinking of on the horizon? Always. <laughs> Always, okay. Always. I, I mean, the first thing is, is, is that hopefully, and our, our main concern right now is, is that we get to August without a catastrophe. And I think that's the most important thing in everybody's mind, is that we don't want another chemical control. We don't want an explosion. And that's why people are so involved in it. I mean, we have to keep the pressure on the Department of Environmental Protection because the judge is there, and the judge, the judge himself expressed a frustration when this was first brought to him. He goes, if I'm in another community, he, this judge sits in Morristown, he said up here in Morristown, the city would walk in and would take those chemicals and get rid of them. But here we don't have anybody willing to walk in and help take care of the problem because for nine months, the Department of Environmental Protection was unwilling to come in to deal with this problem. So he himself was frustrated. And I think we've seen that unless a light is kept under, DEP. Unless we keep a fire under them, as Mr. Watson said, we keep this whole issue in the papers on top of everybody's mind. Uh, we can see years go by. And years means danger. It means people's lives. Every, every minute that the thing is there, you never know what could happen. Well, we have to end this part of it. Um, I wish you luck. I hope everything works out. And I encourage you to continue, as, as Arnold's saying, to keep that fire lit and blazing. Um, we're going to be coming back and speaking about asbestos in the schools. Um, and I, before we leave, I just want to thank Arnold. You're going to be coming back with us, but I want to thank Joe Nardone and Roger Watson for joining us. And we'll be joined with another person uh, who has a little bit of expertise in the asbestos field to tell us a little bit about another danger that's becoming more public. We'll be right back. Good evening. We hope that you are enjoying this evening's show. We also hope that you find our shows interesting, informative, and helpful. We welcome any comments about the shows you viewed or any suggestions you may have for future topics. We would also like to receive a listing of planned activities so that we can include them on our calendar. We'd like to hear from other Ironbound groups, organizations, and clubs. Please contact us at the listed address. Ironbound Insights, 95 Fleming Avenue, Newark, New Jersey, 07105. Ironbound Insights. We're going to talk about asbestos in the schools. And we have Arnold Cohen, who's from the first part of the show with the Ironbound Committee Against Toxic Waste. And we're joined by, with Miles O'Malley of the White Lung Association in New Jersey chapter. Miles, tell us uh, what is the White Lung Association? Vic, the White Lung Association is an organization of asbestos victims, people who have been exposed to asbestos 
and many of whom I'm very sorry to say are currently diseased and dying from asbestos related disease. Asbestos is one of the most potent cancer causing substances known to man and unfortunately it pervades our environment generally and doubly unfortunately it pervades our schools and it poses a tremendous health hazard to our children. The association that you're with, that both the workers that used to work in the asbestos plants and people who may have come and contacted? Yeah. The development of the White Lung Association kind of takes shape uh, based upon the environment in which it finds itself. For instance, in Brooklyn, our membership is primarily former Brooklyn Naval Shipyard workers. We have uh, approximately 300 such members, and uh, the epidemiological record for them is very clear. About 45% of those former Brooklyn Naval Shipyard workers will die from an asbestos-related disease. That, by the way, carries over into New Jersey shipyards. There's the, there was the Federal Shipyard at Kearney, uh, the shipyard at uh, Port Newark, uh, shipyards in Hoboken, and so forth. So our chapter in Brooklyn really is a chapter of shipyard workers. In New Jersey, the chapter is very different because we have been active in the situation in asbestos in the schools here. So our chapter in New Jersey is primarily composed of concerned parents who have been engaged in one form of uh, battle or another trying to save their children from asbestos exposure. How did this asbestos get in the schools? Well, asbestos is, uh, it, it has a kind of a dual function. It's both uh, magic and tragic. The tragic aspect of it we know tremendously well in the White Lung Association. The magic part about it is that it's impervious to heat and it therefore was a, an absolutely wonderful uh, insulating material. And in fact, uh, uh, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, with the uh, initiation of the steam engine and so forth, the various parts of the engine had to be sealed. And initially, they attempted to seal those parts with rags and straw and corn cobs and just about every imaginable thing. And uh, finally, um, what they hit upon, well, well, actually, it wasn't they. It was a man named Johns. Uh, Mr. Johns, who uh, is the Johns in Johns Manville, uh -huh. and uh, I might say uh, uh, peripherally that uh, Mr. Johns died of an asbestos-related disease. He really used asbestos uh, initially in that way, as an insulating material, as a gasket. He, he uh, created the first asbestos gasket, and that was the beginning of his fortunes, and he hooked up with another gentleman by the name of Manville, who was a little better heavily uh, capitalized, and from there we have John's Manville. And they were a maker of asbestos yeah. products. All man as asbestos uh, now appears uh, in over 3,000 products uh, in the, in the, uh, consumed by uh, U.S. people and, and consumed by people around the world. It's that magic substance that's used uh, for many, many uh, different uh, purposes. Arnold, how uh, has the asbestos problem been discovered in the Ironbound? Has, is there a problem? Um, we at the Ironbound Committee Against Toxic Waste were contacted because it's a problem in the schools. And in the Newark schools? In the Newark schools. So that, that throughout the Newark schools, uh, it, there's been surveys that have had to be conducted under federal mandate and they found asbestos. I was speaking to the teachers at Oliver Street about the toxic waste problem in general mm -hmm. in the Iron Mountain section of Newark and when the teachers raised the question, well it's nice to hear about what's happening all over Ironbound, but we have a problem right here in the school with asbestos and they showed me where asbestos was flaking in the school and that's when I reached out to Miles O'Malley to get an expert to say okay here's a problem what do we do to help the parents the teachers the administration at school deal effectively with that problem and what'd you tell them? <laughs> well I I told Arnold that uh, I would visit uh, the office of the acting superintendent of facilities and services that's Bill Ballot to review the consultants' reports 
on all the uh, schools in the Newark uh, district. And a good number of those schools uh, contained quote unquote friable asbestos. That's a term that simply means that the asbestos is powdery, is crumbly in the hand, and is capable of releasing fibers into the quote unquote ambient air, the air that mm -hmm. you breathe. And uh, from a review of the reports, uh, we discovered that uh, in some sense the reports were misleading because they indicated to the acting superintendent that uh, the OSHA two fiber standard, which is an occupational standard, was somehow applicable to school settings. That it was okay for children to be exposed to the levels of asbestos they were exposed to because those levels didn't approach the occupational standard of two fibers per cubic centimeter of air. Now, everybody who knows anything about that occupational standard of two fibers knows that it does not protect against cancer. And in fact, uh, I recently testified in Washington uh, on the OSHA standard, the proposed OSHA standard, which lowers that two fiber standard by at least 75%. So, we what we, d what we said to Mr. Balot was that the reports in that sense were misleading, that he, he really ought to take the levels of asbestos in the schools which, which were cited in the reports and take those much more seriously and not compare them to an occupational standard. We had that conversation with Mr. Balot back in uh, February. In March, we held another conversation with Mr. Ballot, and that was a conversation specifically concerning the Oliver Street School. Mm -hmm. And I told Mr. Ballot that that evening I was going to address a group of parents at the Oliver Street School. And Mr. Ballot and I kind of cut a deal. And what, if, what in effect we said was, we're going to take care of the problem at Oliver Street School. We're going to do the following. Number one, we're going to get high efficiency particulate absolute vacuum cleaners in there, very special vacuum cleaners to clean up the school. We're going to initiate a program of wet mopping and we're going to prohibit dry mopping. In other words, rudimentary, uh, very cost effective hygiene controls of asbestos in the school environment. That evening I addressed the parents uh, at the invitation of uh, Arnold Cohen and uh, I had the consultant's report with me. One uh, section of the report indicated that there was some vandalism at a pipe around the boys' room. This report was done in 1982, by the way. At that meeting that evening, as I addressed the parents, prior to the time I addressed the parents, mm -hmm. I went to the boys' room and I saw a pipe right adjacent to the boys' room, about six feet off the ground, and a large three-foot section of asbestos insulating material was missing from the pipe. It was very clear to me what had happened. The children, as they went to the boys' room, would jump up, smack the pipe, dislodge the asbestos, and therefore get a tremendous dose of asbestos. This was brought to the attention of the superintendent of facilities and services in 1982. In 1984, that pipe had not been corrected. I took 20 or 30 parents and march them past that pipe to show them the seriousness of that situation. The following day, many of them called the office of the superintendent. The problem was not addressed until well into May. Even the hygiene tech, hygienic techniques which we recommended, wet mopping, the prohibition of dry mopping and so forth, as far as I know, were never instituted at all of a street school. And this kind of leads us to our conclusion. We're very worried now because of that history, that the abatement process, the process by which asbestos will be removed from the schools this summer, will not be done properly. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have a record of trust here. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. And what we need also is parent involvement in this process. Were, did the parent, after the parents saw what you showed them um, around the boys' room, did they get a sense of what you were talking about? They most certainly did. And it, it was a very clear example of what we were talking about because you could see over the years how the small children as they went into the boys room actually you know would jump up and dislodge that material the, the the piece of insulation that was missing was directly adjacent the door of the boys room mm -hmm. we're almost out of time Arnold the the you're working with parent groups down there yeah and I, I think what's what happened was is that the parents got promised in 
Easter vacation, we're going to take care of the problem. So the parents felt very good. We had a victory, we won. Easter came, problem wasn't taken care of. Parents again started complaining, and well, we'll take care of it under this, over the summer. And I think they got, they got put off by the promises. And so right now, the big question is going to be to see what happens in the summer, and parents are watching very carefully. A lot of the parents during the school year refuse to let their kids go take gym class mm -hmm. because of the asbestos in the gym. So parents have taken actions, and the big, big time now, right now is going to be the summertime. Okay, we have to conclude, so, but I want to be clear to the people who may be watching, they, they need to be involved both uh, to make sure it gets cleaned up, but it gets cleaned up the right way. Absolutely correct. It's a public health problem. Our experience is that when the parents have been involved in it, it's done properly. When the parents, Vic, have not been involved, it's a so-so situation. Okay. Thank you, Miles O'Malley and Arnold Cohen, and thank you for joining us on Ironbound Insights. Again, this show is brought to you on Channel 26, the public access station, and it's sponsored by the Ironbound Community Corporation. This month, it's only being shown once because of the summer holidays, but back in September, we'll be on the second and fourth Thursday of each month at 5 and 8 p.m. on Channel 26. Thanks again.